Hi, my name's Brad Neal, and let's talk about the photoelectric effect. So this is going to be the work that Einstein's actually going to win his Nobel Prize for. Um, it refers to the observation that electrons um, can actually be ejected from a metal surface if the light of the right wavelength strikes that metal surface. And we've got a little simulation that we're going to show you. It comes from the fine folks over at FET. They produce all one, all kinds of wonderful simulations that I strongly suggest anybody who's got an inkling towards science to go to their website and just play around with all different kinds of things. They've got chemistry, physics, biology, a whole bunch of cool stuff. Highly, highly suggested. Uh, specifically, the one that we're going to be talking about is going to be this one, uh, this that simulation about the photoelectric effect. So here we hopefully eventually get going. Okay, here we go. So behind me, you see the simulation. A um, couple of key things for me to point out. One, we've got a light source up here. Uh, there at the top, I've got the cursor kind of floating around it. And what that light source is pointing at is a metal surface inside of our vacuum tube. So inside this tube, uh, there's nothing. It's, it's been pumped out, um, and so there's just a vacuum inside. Um, the metal right here, this little piece of silver, not the gray, or not the brown thing, but the silver thing, that is going to be sodium. And so what we can do here is we can, one, adjust the uh, wavelength of light that's going to hit our piece of sodium. This bit down here at the bottom with the battery um, and the side over here where it's doing the current versus voltage, for chemistry 150, we're not worried about that component. Uh, we just want to show this as just a general rule of thumb of what, that, what does it mean that you eject an electron from a metal surface when light strikes it. Okay, so here we go. If you go back and you watch one of our previous videos about the basics of what is light, and we talked about photons, well, we can show light as more of its wave property, but we can also show it as kind of like a photon, a particle, because it's got that particle property too. So now I've just got a healthy number of photons of light hitting the metal surface and specifically this is uh, these are photons that have a wavelength of 739 nanometers groovy the light because it's a glass tube can go through the tube and is striking our metal surface inside the vacuum and that's all that's happening but what happens if we change the wavelength? What if we go to a higher energy light? So going to higher energy would require us going more towards the ultraviolet range. So we're gonna go through the red and I'm gonna go slowly here. And we're starting to change colors. We're going into orange and we're gonna hit yellow and we're gonna go more towards green here. And now we're solidly into green. And oh, look what's happening here. We've hit a wavelength of light that now is energetic enough that it's actually causing electrons on the sodium metal to have enough energy that they're getting ejected off of the sodium metal surface. And they're gonna go through the vacuum onto the other electrode over here. So we're actually causing these electrons to get ejected and they're floating through the vacuum of space or through this vacuum to the other side. Now the way that we keep this all electrically neutral is that we have this plate over here connected by a wire and then we're able to go through to the other side and so the electrons are able to close the circuit so everything's still nice electrically neutral. Fantastic. You could imagine a situation where you 
have something like this set up um, and instead of having a battery in here you could have something that does some kind that needs electricity that needs elect the flow of electrons in order for it to work like a fan or something of that nature um, we don't have that set up for this demonstration so approximately well let's call it uh, green wavelengths of light this 516 nanometers wavelength of light was of high enough energy that it started to cause the electrons to be kicked off of the surface. Okay, so I'm gonna scale it back down here. I'm gonna turn our photons off and notice when we scale it back down to that longer wavelength, the electrons quit, or I'm sorry, yeah, the electrons stop flowing. Let's change our metal to something like zinc. Okay, so the simulation now has our piece of metal over here being zinc instead of sodium. And let's do the same thing here. So let's slowly move our slider along and we're increasing the wavelength, we're in, or I'm sorry, we're decreasing the size of the wavelength, we're increasing the energy, and here was that green, and nothing's happening. And this is because Different metals, electrons, require different energies of the incoming photons in order for those electrons to get ejected. Not all metals are the same. So every metal is going to have its own individual wavelength necessary to eject that electron. So if we keep going, we keep going, we're going to higher and higher energies, higher and higher energies. We're now in the purple, pretty strong energy. Oh man, now we're going out into ultraviolet. Okay, so now we're really talking about, okay, so it took us getting out into the ultraviolet range for zinc in order for us to start ejecting electrons. Cool. So hopefully, uh, let's do another metal, why not? Let's do copper, sounds great. And I started off really high already. So we're going to scale it back down. Okay, here we go. Okay, so we are in red light. This is low energy light, and we're going to go to higher energy light. The reason we're going to higher energy is because we don't want to figure out where the electrons stop transporting. It's easier to just see when they start trans uh, start being elect ejected. Okay, so we're now in the green. We're going past the green. And now we're in the blue, higher energy. So it's required, the wavelength is sh smaller, so higher energy than what it took for our original metal, that sodium. And now we're going into the UV. And we can just keep sliding it across. And eventually, okay, we're out in the UV again. Fantastic. So this is going to require a pretty high energy photo incident photon in order to eject an electron off of that copper metal. So th th this is just kind of hopefully helping you visualize what's happening. I, you know, we don't really have something that looks quite like this happening uh, in an, a science experiment, and these electrons aren't floating across this slowly either. They're moving pretty quickly. Um, but this principle is, it, it works. This totally is a valid scientific thing. So that's a nice qualitative way of understanding the photoelectric effect. Let's talk about now uh, a quantitative way of doing this. So we have this equation that you see on the screen now. So we've got this kinetic energy of an electron. So this is how much energy an electron has when it gets kicked off of a surface. And that's going to be equal to 1 half mass of the electrons times the velocity squared. Okay. Another way of writing that out for us with respect to that incident photon radiation is this equation down here. So that kinetic energy of that electron is going to have to equal the Planck's constant times frequency, which would give us the energy of our photon, minus the amount of the energy of our photon, Planck's constant times our frequency. So this is the energy of our photon, uh, or I'm sorry, energy uh, required to eject our electron. So does the incoming radiation have an energy higher 
than the energy necessary to eject the electron. If this first number, this energy of our photon, is lower than the energy required to eject an electron, we're not going to eject the electron. The electron's going to stay on the metal surface. But if that incoming radiation has a higher uh, energy, then yeah, we will eject the electron. So a problem to kind of get us started with this might look something along these lines. It takes this amount of energy to eject an electron from an iron atom. What is the maximum wavelength of light that can do this? Okay, so I'm going to switch over the system to the whiteboard and we'll talk about it. Okay, and we're back. So we want to focus now not on that first equation because that's going to give us the kinetic energy of the electron, but what we're looking for is a wavelength of light uh, that can eject the electron. And since we're going to be dealing with wavelengths, it's better to be thinking about that second uh, row equation. So that kinetic energy of our electron equaling h nu of the incident photon minus h nu of the uh, energy to eject electron. Okay, it's giving us up above that it takes uh, the seven um, seven. 0.21 times 10 to the negative ninth joules of energy to eject an electron from an iron atom. Iron atom part, we don't really need for this problem. It's just kind of a nice little help you out on trivia night when that question comes up inevitably, because that's how trivia nights work. This number, though, is how much energy is, re is required to eject an electron from an iron atom. That's going to be the energy here because we've got energy equals h nu the energy of a photon equation so that number that 7.21 minus 7.21 times 10 to the negative 19 joules is going to go right there nice frees us up to figure out the other parts of the equation. So a thing about this or this question is asking what's the maximum wavelength of light? Okay, so remember longer wavelengths equal less energy. Um, so that's why it's saying maximum wavelength. So it's giving us, and it's saying like, what's the absolute lowest amount of energy necessary to via in light to kick off this electron that's kind of cool it helps us set this problem up because we don't really care what the kinetic energy of the electron is out here we just need that number to be greater than zero that's all so if that number is greater than zero this number right here and i'm actually i'm going to erase this because we just, we just said we need that to be greater than zero. We need the right-hand side of the equation here to just be greater than zero. So any number that is higher than that number will result in the entire, this right-hand side of this equation being greater than zero. And I think I sat there and I put the wrong bracket in. I need this side to be greater than zero. Why don't you guys stop me? I tell you what. So we need this right hand side to be greater than zero. So this number as written then can be our starting point to solve this problem because the number we truly need here we can say anything bigger than as part of our answer to answer this question. What's that mean? Cool. It means take the 7.21 times 10 to the negative 19th joules and use that number as our starting point to solve this problem. This is going to, we're going to need any amount of, uh, 
any energy of a photon to be greater than that number. So let's say, well, what's the wavelength of light that this energy corresponds to? Well, we had E equals H nu, so E here is going to be equal to H, which we said is a constant, Planck's constant. So 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joules times seconds times our frequency. Okay. And if we divide both sides by the 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joules times second, divided by 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joules times second, our entire thing there is going to cancel. That's cool. Units of joules are going to cancel, and we're going to be left with the units of per second right because second here is in the denominator so when we do the math it's going to be still in our denominator it's just going to have one over top of it so per second great because frequency the thing that we're looking for right there that thing is supposed to be in hertz or per second so so far so good um now we need a calculator and we got a nice value of 1.088 times 10 to the 4 15th. And that's equal to our frequency. Cool, because frequency is the same thing as wavelength, right? Nope. We need to change it over. So we can do that with our C equals wavelength times frequency, so the speed of light. So the 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second equals our wavelength times the frequency that we just solved for. 1.088 times 10 to the 15th per second. We multiply, or I'm sorry, we divide both sides by that 1.088 times 10 to the 15th, one over second. 1.088 times 10 to the 15th, 1 over second. Cool. The second here is going to cancel with the second there because the denominator of our numerator is the denominator. The denominator of our denominator is the numerator. So something in the numerator and something in the denominator are going to cancel each other out. So seconds cancel out. And now we're left with the unit of just meters which is groovy because free, our wavelength should be in distance and often that's in meters. So our 2.998 e to the eighth divided by our previous and we end up with something like our frequency of 2.76, I round it up, times 10 to the negative seventh meters. I'm gonna leave it to you to solve that question and turn that into nanometers. And put, post your answer either in your notes, comment section, etc. Please let me know if you have any questions.